this uh, skier right there got a real wake-up call, and it looks like phenomenal skiing just below him, but um, you can see there was a bunch of unstable snow too. So That's me standing there on a, on a summit in uh, Norway, and uh, that was a beautiful ski day. But I'm a full, uh, full certified mountain guide, and so I studied in the United States and finished up all of my guide uh, education and, and exams in 2014. And since then, I've worked in uh, all over Europe and Canada and the United States. I haven't gotten to work in uh, Japan yet, where they have some really good skiing. Um, and I haven't been down to New Zealand yet, but I would like to someday, so we'll see. And ever since university years ago, um, I've been a writer as well. So I've written a couple books, The Mountain Guide Manual and The Ski Guide Manual. And um, I blog occasionally and do some other stuff as well. This year has been slow for guiding, so I've been trying to write a little bit more and, and do that. There is my lovely family, and uh, my wife and I have twin boys, Dominic and Luca. Luca is in the blue ball cap right there, and Dominic's in uh, his purple sunglasses and little uh, sort of shawl thing that we picked up. That was in Morocco. We were messing around. It was fun. That's my wife, Rebecca. And um, then you see one of my books over there, The Ski Guide Manual. That just came out last fall, and it uh, seems like it's selling pretty well. Let's hope. Let's keep it going. And that's uh, me and a couple of guests uh, high above Chamonix last summer. We were preparing to go climb the Matterhorn and doing some practice climbs. But we'll dive into some risk management in the backcountry. And we'll just begin talking about how to manage our risk or lower our risk uh, as we head out, mainly in the winter. But, you know, we can talk about some other things, too, that would apply year round. So as we dive into this, we'll look at how do we lower our risk? How do we avoid avalanche terrain? There are other hazards in the backcountry, as you can imagine. Uh, we'll talk mainly about avalanche terrain. I'm going to assume that folks are a little bit uh, familiar with um, our basic safety gear when we're out in the snow, and that's a beacon, a shovel, and a probe. As you get ready to start skiing off-piste or out of bounds, we'll talk about some critical um, strategies to, to manage your risk and get informed. And then we'll talk a little bit about touring with a guide, because that's how I make my living. And so it's always fun having cool people from all over the planet come and, uh, and go skiing with us. So as we're heading out, you have all sorts of these different hazards. As I mentioned, avalanches are the prime one we'll discuss. But right here, you see um, a big glacier that's dumping into the sea. So on that day, we make sure we don't fall in a crevasse and we make sure the sea ice is nice and uh, frozen. We don't want to fall in the ocean either. About an hour after this photo was taken, we ran into a polar bear right down by the water, which was luckily far enough away. We didn't feel so nervous, but close enough we could see him. So that was pretty cool. That's a, a rare hazard that uh, you don't often encounter while on skis and whatnot. So, and, uh, you know, but as we uh, move into this, we'll look more and more at avalanches, things like that. That's a good friend of mine, uh, snowboarding in Colorado. And here's one of the 57 hours founders in Canada. We did a trip together. This is um, up near Golden, British Columbia. And this was a phenomenal week, but it was really cold. Carmen here, one of the founders at 57 hours is looking pretty happy, but it was actually about 40 below. Uh, in the mornings when we would leave. So we were as bundled up as a person could be, right? But um, that's another hazard, you know, cold and things like that. Um, and uh, when we're really lucky, it all comes together. Woo! So you see some folks hooting and hollering here. Sorry for the audio, but. Woo! Next. You all got phones out. Oh yeah, sublime. So sorry for the the uh, the uh, commentary there, but we were all very excited. That was a really fun run off a place called Loft Peak, and there was about a thousand three hundred meters or five thousand feet of that kind of skiing all the way to Valley Bottom. It was pretty neat. But you know, while we're out there, we need to be really conscious of other hazards. This uh, skier right there got a real wake up call, and it looks like phenomenal skiing just below him. But um, you can see. There was a bunch of unstable snow too. So the, the spooky thing here is you can see the still on that avalanche is you can see just on the right side of the frame, there's another skier waiting to ski right there. And in between the two skiers, there's a, a track that went right down that rib in the middle. So, you know, they had already had one skier on that slope. And so luckily this person triggered that avalanche and it was right below them. So as we start thinking about avalanches, really it requires us to slow down a little bit, make careful decisions. You see a my friend Tim and I standing there right there, we're talking about how to ski this next slope with a bunch of folks in Canada. That was a, another memorable ski run, super fun. And so when we start looking at these slopes, we're asking ourselves a few questions, right? 
as I was saying, once we start looking at avalanche terrain, there's always the option of just not skiing in any avalanche terrain or not skiing at all, right? So maybe you're on a trip somewhere, you could go and just go cross country skiing that day or just avoid it entirely or stay in the ski area. Totally, totally great strategy. Not Sometimes not the most fun, but uh, it, you definitely uh, avoid the hazard that way. But then we can move on to avoiding avalanche terrain in the backcountry. So we could go skiing in the backcountry, but we just avoid any slopes that seem prone to avalanching, right? So that's an, another strategy. That I would say that's the one I employ the most. I just try to avoid the places that are um, more prone to avalanching. We'll talk about how you identify those in just a moment. But as we move out there, we need to recognize that there is a risk in backcountry skiing. That might just be uh, spraining a knee. That might be uh, getting lost after dark or something like that. Um, and so there are risks out there. Usually I would say when I go skiing or rock climbing, I acknowledge, hey, I could, you know, I could get injured. I could sprain an ankle. I could even break a leg skiing. But these are injuries that are not going to prevent me from seeing my family again or, uh, you know, going to climb in Croatia with uh, Peritza next summer, something like that. So we accept those risks, identify them, and then we talk about how to minimize our exposure to those, right? And then when we're recognizing these risks and identifying places that are more or less prone to avalanching, we often use the avalanche bulletin. And so for most of us, that's a viable strategy, right? And we'll talk about where to find those and how to interpret it in just a minute. Oh, there's my little dude, Luca. We were going skiing there. That's one of our first ski days in France when we moved over there. So we just stayed on the ski runs and we let the ski patrol tell us where it was safe to ski that day and it was a blast. So this is always a great strategy. Um, if you're lucky enough to live somewhere, you're on vacation with a ski hill, then the skier, ski patrol um, uh, takes care of the avalanche hazard for you, tells you where is safe, where is not safe, things like this. So it can be a, a nice strategy, right? As we're starting to move out in terrain though, we're looking around to make sure we're not skiing uh, onto an avalanche slope or underneath an avalanche slope. But if you're on a ridge line, and there's no snow above you, well, you can't really get avalanche very easily, right? So you see a beautiful ridge line right there in Canada, and uh, it's, a, it's pretty safe terrain because uh, you can see the big peak in the distance. We're nowhere near that. Everybody's staying right on the ridge, and that was a great day of touring right there. We found a really safe ski run to, to ski up ahead of us. Now, as we start looking at slopes to slide on, right, we got to go downhill a little bit. So we try to ski on low angle slopes. So this was a day that had a bit of avalanche hazard on it. And this is my friend Paul skiing, but you can see it's a pretty low angle slope. This is not going to get you in the ski movies or anything, but it still looks like a pretty good time. Right. And uh, this is uh, often what we're doing right now. Certainly in the United States, we've had a weird year in that we have really unstable snow in Washington state and uh, in Utah, parts of Wyoming and Colorado all at the same time. So that has resulted in some um, pretty nasty accidents and some fatalities. But there's, um, you know, the diversity of terrain in the backcountry is enormous. And so generally you can find some pretty low angle slopes that are not prone to avalanching and ski just like Paul's doing here. And we had a great day that day, it was cool. So if we wanna go up in the higher mountains or if it's a day where the avalanche hazard is a little lower, maybe we can start getting up on some of these steeper slopes, right? So we need to be really careful though, that we can identify what is and is not avalanche terrain and what, how steep of a slope uh, is more prone to sliding, right? So how steep is avalanche terrain? For those of you who've done an awareness course or maybe a level one course, you might remember most avalanches occur between 30 and 45 degrees on the slope, okay? Now we'll also talk about how to determine what a 30 degree slope is and measure these things in just a moment. But, um, and I'll show you, you probably already own a tool to do that. You might not realize it, but you can see the slope I'm standing on right there is right about 29 or 30 degrees. So you can see it's a pretty good angle, super fun for sliding on snow. And if you stay below those angles and you're not beneath a slope that's steeper than that, you can minimize a bunch of the avalanche hazard right there. So this was another fun day skiing with my buddy Scott right behind me. But that angle of slope right there is about, no, that's when you really need to start thinking, hey, am I on an avalanche slope? Am I below an avalanche slope? Things like that. So you can see you can still have a lot of fun on slopes that are not so prone to avalanching, right? So we've recognized the risk. There are avalanches out there. They occur on certain terrain on certain days of the year. And we're gonna talk about how to identify what those are. Um, and notice I'm trying to avoid using the word safe or safely, things like that. We really try to say more or less safe or, or something. Um, but you know, when I have guests in the backcountry and we're going rock climbing or ice climbing or skiing, I am pretty frank about most of these activities have an inherent risk to them. 
you know, now my job as a mountain guide and your job, if you're going to go out skiing on your own is to minimize those risks and come back healthy and in one piece at the end of the day. Um, but we try to avoid portraying this as completely without hazard or risk or anything like that. Now, luckily the, the hazard, the risks are usually lower than driving to and from the trailhead or the ski area. So it's a pretty reasonable activity. But once we identify those risks, we try to minimize our exposure to them, right? And we'll start diving into to how to do that, right? Here's a couple of my buddies on my, my right and my left. I'm in the middle there. That was a really cold day. I remember it. And um, when we start identifying those hazards and saying, hey, can we live with this? Is this what people are actually paying for? Or does this seem like an unreasonable hazard, right? And we, and we dive into it, right? So chief among lowering our risk is just knowing, are we in or out of avalanche terrain? And if you can answer that question um, consistently and accurately, you can remove most of the avalanche hazard from your life, right? So how do we know this? Okay, we'll start out with maps and guidebooks and photos. Now this is stuff you can do at home uh, before you leave the house, before you're cold, before you're sitting there looking at a big open slope of um, untracked snow that you wanna ski, right? So often we can determine where um, avalanche slopes are before we've even left the trailhead and then we can agree to avoid those, go way around them or just not ski on them at all, things like that. And we'll talk a little bit about how to do that from a map. Guidebooks will often give you um, a leg up on how to do this. There's guidebooks for all over the Alps, uh, all over uh, North America, you know, Washington State, Colorado, up in Canada, things like this. And then, um, and then from photos, you can often get a, an idea as well. So here's this tool that I was discussing, a clinometer. I'll show you a couple images of those and we'll just talk a little bit about how to use them. And then I'm gonna bug everybody to please come and do an avalanche course at some point. If you live somewhere far away, um, I'll try to help you find one. Um, mountain clubs often offer them, guide services offer them, and occasionally, you know, your local avalanche forecast center might connect you with um, an instructor or resources to do that. I know the one down in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, the, Av the avalanche center itself offers courses, right? So we'll talk a little bit about that. So we'll get out there into the terrain. There's another great Canada shot, beautiful day. And we'll start moving into, yeah, a little bit more of avalanche terrain. So we, we, we know we can avoid it by just not skiing in any avalanche terrain or not going in the backcountry. But as we move into the terrain, here's one strategy. I just include this because it's such a cool photo and it happened just a couple months ago. But a friend and I were going skiing. This is above Chamonix. And um, we came upon this big slope and looked down it. And wow, it had avalanche just in the last 24 hours. So you can see that jagged line going across the slope. That's the what we call the crown or the initial fracture that cracked and then propagated across the slope. And this avalanche uh, was natural, meaning that just the weight of the snow and some um, unstable snow crystals below the new snow combined to create a, an avalanche all on its own. And this thing was, geez, several hundred meters wide. It was really um, an interesting feature, but you can see my friend Chris slid right out there and stepped down where the old snow used to be. And now all that unstable snow has slid away. And so we're having to look at it right there. So often we will go skiing around and look for slopes that have um, previously avalanched and gotten rid of some of that un, um, unstable snow, something like that. But it's a little bit more of an advanced um, technique, but at certain times it can help you if you find the slope you were worried about is already avalanched, then um, you're off the hook, right? So here's a slope that is below 30 degrees. Remember, we said those avalanches occur between 35 and 45 degrees, 30 and 45 degrees, usually, right? And here is a, uh, a beautiful slope, untracked uh, snow. That's my friend Trey up there looking downhill. And those are my little wiggly turns coming down from there. So as I'm standing there, how do I know that that slope was below 30 degrees? We looked at it from above. And this is a local ski area to Chamonix. It was closed, unfortunately, for COVID. So the lifts were not running. So we went up there and went uphill on our own and then, and then skied down some of the areas um, that would usually be full of people riding chairlifts and whatnot. But so we know the area. We're pretty familiar with it. You can see we had very good visibility that day. And you could look down the slope and really see that it was indeed a low angle slope. You know, Trey is a longtime backcountry skier and I am too. So we were pretty confident, hey, this slope is under 30 degrees and we're not taking a huge risk here. But for somebody who had never been there, this is the map of that area, right? So you see that black arrow in the lower right, that's showing right where I was about uh, standing when I took that photo. And you can see there, if you haven't worked with these, what we call a topographic map, there's tons of online resources, there's books, you can hire somebody. Um, there's a bunch of courses where you can get familiar with these. 
but you see those lines that go across and you see 1950 meters. Those are lines showing you elevation, right? So as the lines get tighter and more packed together, you know the slope is steeper. So in the lower right part of the slope where the black arrow starts, you can see those lines are very, very tight. That is in fact a really steep slope that I would not have skied on that day. But right where we're standing, you can see the um, contour lines are a bit more spaced out, right? So that's one way I know, hey, this is a pretty low angle slope. I'm not so nervous about it, great, okay? Now, this is that same map. Now you notice there's some shading on it. So you see those uh, blotches of yellow, orange, darker orange, maybe even red. This is what we call slope angle shading. And a, um, a bunch of different apps have this now. There's one in North America called CalTopo. This one is called Gaia GPS. It's one I use. Um, there's also Backcountry Navigator. There's a bunch of these things. Um, the Swiss Avalanche app that you can have on your phone, it also has this. Um, and so this is just a slope angle meter that gives you an idea of the average angle of that slope, right? So remember where I said the contour lines were very tightly packed down below the arrow? So now you can see those are all red. That means it's steeper than 35 or 40 degrees. So that's prime avalanche terrain. Now where I was standing, where the black arrow is, you can see there's no shading at all, which means it's under 28 degrees. So that's a place where I can be standing and uh, pretty relaxed on this day. There's a bit of um, you know, light orange snow way up above and to the left, but under these avalanche conditions, um, things were not avalanching very easily nor traveling very far on this particular day. So you can see where my buddy and I skied, we skied under that lift line where it says Teleski de Posette, we skied under there and then came down to where the arrow was and then traversed over to that pink road up there where it says uh, 1973. So a pretty uh, low exposure tour. And this is just one of these techniques that you can begin to use. It gives you an idea of the slope angle. And then once you're in the field, you really need to verify that the map was correct because there are errors in the data and things like that. But this is one way you can do it um, is use maps, read in the guidebook, use your eyeballs once you get out there. And then once you're in the field, we can use these clinometer tools, right? Okay, so here are these clinometers. Now, you see that there are several you know, of these devices, little plastic cards and things like that. And they all, you just hold it up to the slope, either from the side or on your ski pole. And they'll, they'll give you a very rough, it's by no means exact, um, indication of the slope angle. Now down on the right, you see, uh, this is an iPhone. I'm assuming Google phones have a similar app in there, but if you pick up your iPhone right now and, and uh, look at your apps, you probably have one called measure. And that is a clinometer inside your phone. It's great to, um, if you're hanging a picture frame or a bookshelf at home, um, you can see if you're doing it flat. Well, we do the same thing out skiing. Now we try to do that from the side of a slope at a safe spot or on a smaller slope um, nearby and we'll lay a ski pole on there and put our phone on there. And then you can get a, a general idea of how steep the slope is. But if, you know, if it says 26 degrees and it's pretty representative of all the slope you're skiing on, then that's a pretty good indication you're on a slope that's under 30 degrees. So these, that's just an introduction to how you might use a clinometer in the field to keep yourself safer, right? Everybody probably are, is already carrying one in their pocket. So I hate to put any, uh, any of these little, um, manufacturers out of business that sell these things, but you probably already got one. The one I use is on my iPhone. So don't feel like you have to go spend a bunch of money on it. Yeah. So after you, you know, have um, gotten a little introduction to some of those um, tools, you may come and take an avalanche course and really learn how to apply them. Right. So uh, you get in the field, you begin measuring slope angle in the classroom, but also out there with an instructor. And if you're lucky, you get to do it with a certified um, a ski guide. So she or he is really uh, experienced in moving uphill and downhill and things like that. And they'll give you some great ideas, things like that. And then once you do a level one avalanche course, which is usually at two or three days, you know, three or four days, um, depending where you do it, the Canadians do it in two days, the Americans in three days, Europeans have different uh, models. Um, then you start moving out into the terrain and you can start applying it on your own, right? So here's a pretty darn safe slope on a day that was absolutely fantastic. We were the first ones there, so we got to make our little marks down on it. And this is above um, Chamonix and what they call the Valle Blanche, or the world's most famous ski run, however you wanna look at it, but pretty neat day. So you, you kind of move into this and start applying it on your own, right? Now, key to doing this on your own is using, the, using these avalanche bulletins and forecasts. So most places that are fairly well populated, so Washington State, Colorado, Wyoming, you know, all over British Columbia and then all over uh, Western Europe, you're going to have an avalanche center. And those people are in charge of keeping highways open, keeping towns safe, things like this, but also forecasting what the avalanche danger is, where you're going to find it, how elevated is it, things like that. 
And um, once you begin reading this, I encourage everybody to start reading the bulletin um, either at your home area or someplace maybe you're going on vacation this year, something like that, and that you can begin familiarizing yourself with them. They tend to be as similar but not identical. So you'll get used to you know, how your local forecast center presents the uh, information. But then you can identify the hazard, see where it is, figure out if you can avoid it. If you feel like you can avo avoid it, go skiing at the ski area, no problem, right? So I just grabbed um, a few images from the Avalanche Bulletin for Utah and um, the Salt Lake Zone. So Utah has, I, I don't know, six or seven zones within the whole state. This is the one immediately east of Salt Lake where um, the Cottonwood Canyons are. So Alta, Snowbird, the canyons, places like that are, are, um, are captured in this bulletin. So as you open that website, just Google Utah Avalanche Center or Colorado Avalanche Center or wherever. You can also go to avalanche.org and it'll show you all the forecast centers in North America or avalanches with an s.org and that'll show you all the forecast centers in Europe. You'll find a website, boom, click on it, here you go. So you can see this is a forecast that's trying to give you a sense of how elevated the danger is and where on the mountain you're gonna find more and less uh, hazard, okay? So if we start on the left side, you see that what we call the avalanche rose or the compass rose, that yellow and orange circular um, icon. And this is trying to show you a three-dimensional representation of the mountain. So this lower band is generally below uh, where tree line is or, or it's showing you where forested terrain is. The middle one is showing you the area right around where the trees are. So they're starting to thin out as we get into higher mountains, but there's still trees there. So we call that tree line. And then this top little one is what we call the alpine or above tree line. And this will change in terms of elevation based on where you are. Tree line is a little lower in Salt Lake than it is in Colorado. And tree line is a little lower in the Alps than it is in Salt Lake even. So these elevations will be a little bit um, location dependent, but that gives you a rough idea of the elevation at which you're gonna find different hazard ratings, okay? Now you notice it's also, there's north, south, east, west. So this also gives you a sense of on what aspect or face of the mountain you're gonna find more or less hazard, okay? So as we look down at the bottom of the slide, you see this is the danger scale. So we have five levels going from uh, green or level one or low, all the way up to black extreme level five. It is rare you're going to see extreme avalanche danger. We have had it a couple times this year in uh, North America, a little bit in Europe as well. And so on those days that are extreme, I'm typically not skiing at all because you're going to have enormous avalanches, very destructive, and they're going to be widespread. So to me, that just sounds like I have too much, too many uh, hazards looking to, to injure me. So I just tend to avoid it. Okay. But these ratings, and they're pretty consistent worldwide, you're gonna have either the color or level one, two, three, four, five, things like that. They're, um, they give you a sense of how risky it is to be out. And then this rose gives you an idea of where it's more or less hazardous. So you can see this one below tree line, all the way around the mountains, it's moderate, which means natural avalanches are unlikely to occur human triggered avalanches are possible if you ski in the wrong spot. So how do we know where the wrong spot is? Well, we bump to the text here and we read that and that gives us a much better, more detailed idea of where these avalanches are occurring, okay? So you see the, the bulletin mentions considerable, that's level three orange, and that's on the north half of the compass, pretty much around the southeast even, above tree line and right at tree line. So if we were going to avoid avalanches as best we can today, we might just say, well, we're not going to ski any terrain from sort of west, southwest around to southeast at tree line or above. And then that will keep the whole danger rows yellow, which means naturals are unlikely. And if we avoid certain terrain features, um, we're probably pretty darn good. Okay. Now we read in the text, considerable danger means that human triggered avalanches are likely. So orange means if you ski in the wrong spot, you will likely trigger an avalanche. So for me, I don't like those odds. Some people who can live with it, me, I don't know. And then they tell you it's more prevalent west around north to southeast, anywhere the wind has drifted snow, and they say cornices are to be avoided. So right there, we have the elevations where the danger is higher, the aspects or the direction the mountain is facing where it's more, um, uh, more hazard. And then they tell you the terrain you're looking for, meaning anywhere there's wind drifted snow or there's big cornices. So right there, we have a really good idea of what to avoid when we leave the trailhead. 
Okay. And then down below, they try to give you a little pep talk. Safe and enjoyable powder can be found on low angle slopes with no overhead hazard. That means you're not below a big feature or a giant mountain that could avalanche and run down onto the terrain where you are. Okay. So that might be the first uh, page of the website or just the top of the page. And we scroll down a little bit. Now they're going to go into what's called avalanche problems. Now the language with these will change a little bit. Okay. So in Europe, when they say persistent weak layer, they usually refer to that as old snow. The English speaking centers, so that's New Zealand, Canada, um, mostly the United States and Scotland, they will talk about these same avalanche problems, persistent weak layer. So they describe how those avalanches behave, right? And they talk about, you know, where you're going to find those. And then they also give you an idea of the likelihood that you could trigger one. So it's likely. And then they give you the potential size of those avalanches. Could be medium to large, right? So keep in mind, it doesn't take much more than a small avalanche to bury you in three feet of snow or a meter of snow. Okay, so if they're forecasting medium to large avalanches that are likely triggered by a human on these aspects at these elevations, then you really got to pay attention, right? And then they get into some more uh, details down here, okay? So they talk about um, a deep slab avalanche could be two to five feet. So let's say 80 centimeters to a meter and a half deep. That's a really big, um, thick slab of snow that breaks, slides downhill. And if you're tumbled in there, man, it, it's not gonna be a fun ride, right? So this gives you a bunch of detail. Now we could keep sliding down and there's another avalanche problem on this day. So this is the problem in North America this year is we've had some of these times where there's multiple avalanche problems. You really gotta keep uh, track of them. So this is that wind drifted snow, that means Snow fell out of the sky and then the wind came up and created these big wind pillows of snow that are prone to avalanche, right? So they give you uh, an idea here of where you're gonna find those. They talk about them and then they show you on the rows again. So to me, it looks like there's a lot of places to get into trouble uh, on this particular day. This was last week in Utah. Um, and uh, you saw, I don't, for folks in North America, maybe a little bit in Europe, there was a, a really unfortunate accident where eight people were caught and four of them died. This is. Oh, it must be a couple of weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago now. So they were really having trouble with their snowpack over there. But the forecasters on that day that those people got caught, they really described the terrain in which those people were caught and had their accident. Uh, they described it pretty accurately. So had those folks been able to say, well, we're just going to avoid that terrain entirely, that might have been a different outcome. Also in the bulletin, we you've seen you have a danger rating. They're going to tell you where it is. They're going to describe it in that text. And they give you some information on what kind of avalanches those are. So we said persistent slab and wind drifted snow right there. Um, in Europe, they'll say often in Italian and French, they say snow touched by wind, but it's all kind of the same avalanche type right there. Now they may also include photographs of where they've seen avalanches. So this is from that exact same day. And you can see the photo on the left. You can see that big crown or that fracture going around that bowl. And that looks like pretty real terrain, right? Pretty steep, rocky, lots of shoots. And then over there in the trees, if you zoom in a little bit, you can see there is a crown running through the trees right there. And that, so they can be in these, avalanches can occur in these sneaky places that you might not, um, you know, really identify as big, scary, spooky terrain, right? But if you read the bulletin closely, take your time with it, 10, 15 minutes in the morning. I tend to carry a notebook, so I have notes of what they were warning about. That way I can't fool myself into doing something dumb once I'm in the field. You can really stay disciplined and avoid these uh, problem spots that the forecasters are worried about. The forecasters tend to be avid backcountry skiers like me, like a lot of us, um, but they are, it's their job to be out there every day, even when the snow is terrible. So when you and I decide, oh, the skiing's terrible, we're going to stay in the hot tub, you know, today or whatever, um, the forecasters will still go out and see what's happening, see what the snow is doing, have there been avalanches, where are these avalanches happening, things like that. So and these folks are out there day in and day out really watching for us. So it's, you know, it's like having an expert every morning write you a personalized email saying, hey, here's what I'm seeing. Here's where you could get into trouble. Here's where you might find good snow. So it really is almost a, you know, it's like cheating for us a little bit. But I do it every single morning. Um, even on the days I'm not skiing, I will look at the bulletin just to see, hey, or, you know, has it been a big storm? Was there rain? Was there a big warm up? Are there avalanches? Are there not avalanches? Things like that. So then I'm set up on the days where I'm working to really have an idea of what the snowpack is doing, what the trends have been, things like that. 
So these photos and text descriptions will totally set you up for making safer decisions. And you see on the, uh, the last bit of this paragraph here where it says slope angle is the great equalizer right now. So Drew Hardesty wrote this um, bulletin and Drew is a long time forecaster and he all of this expertise goes into this forecast but in the end he says slope angle is the great equalizer. So if we just stay off of slopes and um, uh, stay away from being below slopes that are steeper than 30 degrees, you're going to remove most of the avalanche hazard from your day. And, you know, in Colorado, we do that for much of the winter. It makes it tough, but we do that for much of the winter. So now this is a, a video that forecasters will often Ready? post uh -huh. of a snowpack test. So watch when she starts lifting her arm off the shovel about 10 cent, no, 20 centimeters deep. Boom. Did you see that crack go across the whole column? This is a snowpack test. Now, these are the sorts of things you learn once you've done a level one avalanche course and you're moving towards a level two. There are several of these snowpack tests that we use in addition to other observations. And we go skiing and see avalanches on every slope. That's by far the most important observation you're going to make. That means avalanches are happening all over the place. If we go skiing and we have these warmths under our skis, meaning the snow is actually collapsing under our body weight, that's another great observation that there's unstable snow. Now this, this looks like a pretty safe slope. Let's imagine she's going to ski a slope nearby that's a little bit bigger. She might put those probes in the snow and then she cuts around this column. So that column is separated all the way around and then she taps on her shovel. This is a test that was developed uh, in part with some folks in Montana. And I think the Kiwis uh, contributed as well. This is called an extended column test. So as she's tapping from the wrist, she's seeing a can a light tap initiate a fracture that crosses this block? And then you'll see once she lifts her whole arm off and lets it drop, that's a slightly um, harder tap. Watch it again, and when she lifts from the okay. elbow, look about 20 centimeters deep, and you'll see that crack go across the block all at once. And that would be alarming. Boom. So you saw the crack go all the way up across and snow almost pop out the ends. That's literally stiffer, stronger, harder snow above, collapsing into weaker, loosely packed snow below. And this is the sort of stuff you begin easing into when you do an avalanche course. And um, you can begin to incorporate observations, snowpack tests, things like that, and of course the bulletin into your decision of where to ski and most importantly, where not to ski on a certain day. So that's just a little intro to a snowpack test. There's several of them out there. And it's not rocket science, but it does take some coaching to understand what you're looking for, how to do it, and how to incorporate that into your uh, decision making. So here's my plea to uh, everybody come take a level one avalanche course if you're going to, you know, make this a pastime of yours. They're, they're really, really fun. Generally, you're in a, you know, a, a class of five or six or, you know, eight or 10 people that are, you know, pretty into skiing and doing the stuff you're into doing as well. So it's a fun time. And this will really jumpstart your learning in the backcountry. And then uh, certainly in North America, and it's starting to be a little more standardized in Europe, but there's a progression of courses you can do that will really occupy you for the next six, eight, 10 years um, in terms of companion rescue, a level one, a level two, things like this. And uh, that's a great way to get going. And then of course, um, you know, skiing with a guide can be a fantastic way to uh, accrue experience too, because then you're getting a coached experience and you can be making some decisions with a guy behind you. And she might say, well, let's think about this a little bit more, something like that. This is um, colleagues, some colleagues and I up at a lodge in Canada where we did a week long level two avalanche course, which is just so much fun. And if students are in front, they get to uh, really spend a ton of time in the field. It's great. We bring a chef too. So it's pretty neat. Nobody has to cook. It's cool. Um, but I encourage everybody to start thinking about an avalanche course. And then as you're acquiring these skills, you really got to practice, right? So this, these are folks on that same course practicing uh, digging up a buried avalanche victim. Now, I have never dug up a person. Um, I've never been buried. I don't want to give you all the impression that we go out skiing and every third day we have an accident or something like this. I don't think anybody in this group had ever actually been involved in a real rescue. But we really... Uh, practice in the event that we come up, uh, upon another accident or God, God forbid we have an accident on our own, something like this. You really want to um, be proficient with these avalanche transceivers 
and you wanna have um, at least a strategy for digging because digging is actually the bulk of your rescue. It's not the most enjoyable part of an avalanche course, but you know, it's a necessary evil. We go out there and, and do it. I do it you know, once or twice a year with friends just to stay sharp. And, and then we also dig into the snow and we look at different layers of snow and, and see, uh, are they bonding together? Are they loosely um, you know, sort of attached to one another? Is it easy to trigger these snowpack tests in an avalanche or is all the snowpack really welded together? That's what we're hoping to see when we dig. And, you know, like I said, this was uh, the, the first year we did an avalanche course up in Canada. The gentleman in the middle there with those goggles on his head and the orange jacket, that's one of my main mentors. He's a great guy who's been a mountain guide for 40 years and is just a, a real, uh, uh, you know, resource for me. He's been great. He helped write my book and whatnot. It was cool. But, uh, you know, usually they're pretty fun uh, experiences, too. You get up there with a bunch of people from different parts of the world. It's, it's pretty cool. And then ideally you get to make a few turns as well. That was a, a fun uh, week. We had just phenomenal snow every night. And like I said, if you're somewhere, um, you can hire a guide. It is an expense, you know, but if you get three or four friends together, you can hire a, a really good mountain guide. Um, anywhere there are mountains, there's probably a mountain guide or two working. In general, I would say your ski skills need to be, you know, what we say in American English, intermediate. So you don't have to be a total pro, but it's nice if you have a couple seasons of skiing on the piste um, uh, before you try backcountry skiing. The, the snow backcountry skiing tends to be more variable and less consistent. So it demands a little bit better ski technique. But that said, you don't have to be a, a super expert. Part of what guides do is we talk to a client beforehand. So you go on 57 hours, you're going to St. Anton, you find somebody in St. Anton, message him and her and say, I've been skiing for four years. I want to try backcountry skiing. Chances are that guide already has a great idea of where to take you that's going to be um, fun skiing for you without being too difficult. And then obviously she or he is going to be keeping track of avalanche hazards and all these things. And then they'll know where the good place to eat for lunch is too. So um, if you get a really good guide, it, it, uh, it pays off. So, um, and that's really how 57 hours got going was just people trying to, you know, uh, if I'm in Boulder, Colorado right now, and I'm going to go to Whistler, British Columbia, and I don't know anybody up there, I go on the app and I find somebody, she or he is, looks like somebody that does the kind of skiing I want to do. Boom. You book that person, text with them a little bit. Hey, I'm, I want to, you know, try out uh, backcountry skiing and I want to practice with an avalanche beacon. Great. They'll, you know, fix a day for you. It'll be great. And, uh, and you'll have a great time. So. No